Janmadhyasya yato niveya ditaratas charte su vigyaswarat. Tene Brahma Hridaya Adikavaye Muyantiat Surayaha Tejo Vari Medam Yata Vini Mayo Yatra Trisargo Mesha Damna Svenu Sada Nirasta Kuhakam Satyam Parandi Mahi O oh, my Lord, Sri Krishna, son of Vasudeva. O oh, all-pervading personality of Godhead, uh, for my respectful base, it is not to you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth and the primeval cause of all causes of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there's no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji, the original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. as one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen on fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes, temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature, appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma Pujita Kaitravotra Paramo Nirmatsaranam Satam Vedyam Vastavam Atra Vastu Shivadam Tapatrayon Mulanam Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite Kimba Parehar Ishwaraha Sadyohide Avarudyate Tra Krite Vihesa Susabhistakshana Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth, which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge. The Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpataro galitam falam sukumakad amrita drabya samyutam vibhata bhagavatam rasam alayam muhur ahorasika buvibhavu kaha O expert and thoughtful man, relish shimad bhagavatam. The mature fruit of the desire tree of Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadeva Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Although its nectarian juice was already relished for all, including liberated souls. Shinvatam Swakata Krishna. Punya Shravana Kirtana Kirdiantak Stohi Bhadrani Vidu Nati Srihit Satam To hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita 
is itself righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna is dwelling in everyone's heart, acts as the best wishing friend and purifies the and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttamas Loke Bhaktir Bhavati Naistiki In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajas tamo bhava, kamalo badayas chayi, chete taranavidam, sthitvam sattve prasiddhati. By development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus, material lust and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso bhagavat bhakti yogataha bhagavat tattva vigyanam mukta sangha shajayate. When these impurities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in his in his position of devotional service. I'm sorry, in his, in his position of uh, uh, pure, pure goodness, right? <laughs> Becomes enlivened by devotional service and understands the science of God perfect. Vidyate hridaya grantis chidyante sarvasam saya siyante chasthikarmani drista evat manishwari Thus, Bhakti Yoga severs the hard knot of material affection and enables one to come at once to the stage of Samsayam Samagran. Understanding of the Supreme Absolute Truth, Personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 15, Verse Number 50. Tropadi cha tadagyaya. Patinam anapekshatam Vasudeve Bhagavati Ekanta Matir Apatam Translation Drupadi also saw that her husbands, without caring for her, were leaving home. She knew well about Lord Vasudeva Krishna the personality Godhead, both she and Subhadra became absorbed in thoughts of Krishna and attained the same results as their husbands. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada. When flying an airplane, one cannot take care of other planes. Everyone has to take care of his own plane. And if there's any danger, no other plane can help another in that condition. Similarly, at the end of life, when one has to go back home, back to Godhead, everyone has to take care of himself without help rendered by another. The help is, however, offered on the ground before flying in space. Similarly, the spiritual master, the father, the mother, the relatives, the husband, and others can all render help during one's lifetime. But while crossing the sea, one has to take care of himself and utilize the instructions formerly received. Draupadi had five husbands, and no one asked Draupadi to come. Draupadi had to take care of herself without waiting for her great husbands. And because she was already trained, 
she at once took to concentration upon the lotus feet of Lord Vasudeva, Krishna, the personality of Godhead. The wives also got the same result as their husbands in the same manner. That is to say, without changing their bodies, they reached the destination of Godhead. Srila Vishwanatha Chakravati Thakur suggests that both Draupadi and Subhadra, although her name is not mentioned herein, got the same result. None of them had to quit the body. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So this is a fact of life. Everything depends on our training in Krishna consciousness. And if we're lucky enough to have sincere mentors, not tormentors, but mentors, then we can make tangible spiritual advancement in this life and at the moment of, the de of death be prepared for it and not be completely dependent on others. This is hard to imagine, but it is definitely a fact that uh, the devotees develop this attitude of a dira, dira statranamuyati. The dira is never bewildered by illusionary things. A dira is someone who has a factual basis on which they can observe reality without becoming disturbed by it. Most people don't have that factual basis for observing reality. They have illusory basis, and therefore they become bewildered easily. But the devotee, because there's constant hearing and chanting in the life of a devotee, there's constant hearing and chanting, and also in, in sharing their realizations with others uh, for inspiration, uh, it is the defining quality of a devotee. It's not that the devotee is a good singer or a good dancer or uh, good pujari, all those things are important in one sense. But the main thing is the devotee's mind is always fixed on Krishna. That's the real essential quality of a devotee. One who always engages in devotional service and is never and never falls down. And in other words, they're fixed in their uh, dutiful activities in devotional service. Such a person transcends the influence of the modes of material nature and is situated in the stage of Brahman. Also, uh, it says, Abhyasa Yoga Yuktena Chaitasa Nam Yagamina Paraman Purusham Divyam Yati Parthanu Chintayan. So, uh, this verse says that uh, with one-minded attention, if one is always meditating on Krishna, they uh, are very dear to the Lord because this is what the Lord wants. He wants us to be meditating on him all the time. And just like you would like your children to always be thinking about uh, the instructions that you've given them. So Krishna says, he who meditates upon me as a Supreme Person of Godhead, his mind constantly engaged in remembering me, undeviated from the path, he, O Partha, is sure to reach me. So therefore, with this very intense meditation on Krishna, when one perceives that they are approaching death, they're not afraid of anything. They're not confused what's going to happen next. They know what's going to happen because they've been practicing their whole life. This is called training. If you want to be an Olympic champion, you have to train. If you want to be a boxing champion, you have to train. If you want to be uh, a scientist, you have to be trained. You want to be a doctor, you have to be trained. You want to be a devotee, you have to be trained. And it depends who your trainer is. If your trainer is your lust, anger, and greed, you go nowhere. 
you backpedal, you go to hell. But if your trainer is a genuine devotee and there's tough love, as they say in French, qui uh, châtie bien aime bien, which means uh, he who will give you punishment actually loves you. Punishment doesn't mean to hurt you, but uh, trains you to be uh, renounced and, uh, and austere in your lifestyle. See? Because what, what entraps people? It's the glitter of material advancement. And, and what, what is considered material advancement? You know, a nice body, and good education, good job, good wealth, nice car, and all these nice, 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 nice things. And with every nice thing, you get more entangled. So look at the Goswamis. They went from being the richest people in uh, Bengal. And Bengal was a very wealthy uh, state because of all its natural uh, resources. And then they went from that to living under trees with only one cloth. They didn't have a wardrobe. You know, nowadays you, you would see California closets, right? So you pay them uh, $15,000 and they come and they make your closet look really, really nice, you know, and you can put all your shoes, just like uh, uh, rich ladies, they have like, you know, sometimes. 500 pairs of high heels. Uh, the wife of Mar Marcus, he was, the, he, was the, he was the dictator of uh, the Philippines at one time. She had 3,000 high heels. You know how much they And they were all designer high heels. And she had to have a special huge uh, uh, place to, to keep all those shoes, right? So whenever, if, even if you go on the internet, you'll see uh, the movie stars and pe people like that. Every once in a while, you get a chance to look into their mansion. And then you see, you know, they have these huge wine cellars and they have these huge uh, wardrobes with, uh, full of shoes and expensive clothing. And then they put their jewelry on exhibit also. In, in, just like you would go into a, a jeweler's shop they have everything and, and with lights and, and uh, windows. Of course, they have the security system also. All this is nonsense. People don't need all these things to be happy. But they think they do. And then they collect all these things, and when they die, they lose all these things. Okay. So what's the use of it? You can't take it with you. <clears throat> so... All these things actually belong to Krishna. So if, if there's going to be opulence, it should be opulence for Krishna. And this was the way India lived for thousands and millions of years. In, in, a, in a village, each of the, the cottages were small and simple. And it wasn't full of furniture and full of this and full of that. It was very, very simple. But the temple was very ornate and opulent. And people would spend a lot of time in a temple. It was the main place where they would go every day, besides going to the fields and working in the fields. And people would bathe two or three times a day. And they lived in a place where the weather was generally nice and where there was two or three growing seasons. And there was a rainy season. And, and so many things were, made life easy because they were pious. Nowadays, you know, you live in Minneapolis and it's freezing. Like sometimes it goes 40 below. <laughs> and you have to have all these expensive apartments with heating systems and generators and this thing and that thing. You know, it's, I mean, it's very, very difficult. If you don't have money, you, it's very hard to live there. You know, you have to work very hard to be able to pay for all those things. So this meditating on Krishna the training to get to meditate your mind on Krishna, this is, and, and be always focused on, on serving Krishna, this is the purpose of education. It's not because you know uh, JavaScript or something that you're educated. 
that's not going to save you at the moment of death. And death can come anytime. How many times have I done funerals for men who went jogging on a, uh, in the forest and they slipped and killed themselves? And they were like, you know, uh, they, they had a job in Microsoft, a nice wife, and a, a new baby, a nice car, a nice house, everything, and they're dead. Right? So this happens a lot. Uh, I've, I've, like I said, I've performed funerals for people like that, or a wife who gets some kind of a little disease, and all of a sudden goes to see the doctor, and says, oh, we have to take an MRI, and now we have to do an ultrasound, and now we have to do an X-ray, and now we have to take a blood uh, sample. And then they, they say, well, uh, it looks like you have this, uh, not sure if it's benign or cancerous growth in your womb. She said, well, what are you going to do? Well, well, we'll have to do a biopsy. So they do a biopsy and they said, well, it looks like it's cancer. Oh, doctor, what, what's going well, we'll have to operate. We'll have to take your womb out. <laughs> so after taking the womb out, then they say, oh, it also spread to your intestine. And you know, the lady's only like, 30 years old, has two young kids, a husband. And, and she says, well, what are you going to do? We have to take your intestines out. And you'll, you'll get this rubber, uh, rubber bag and uh, every, all, the, all, the, all the stool and urine goes into that bag. And she says, I mean, I have to live like that the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah, you'll be all right. A lot of people will have this. <laughs> so now they take their in her t intestines out. And this happened to one devotee lady that I know who... who very soon after she had the intestine out and she had the bag, she only lasted one year and she died. I mean, it's crazy. A lot of young ladies, Indian ladies, die like that because, you know, once you get, they, they put, just like we saw what happened to Bhakti Chiru Maharaj, as soon as he went into the hospital, everyone would say, oh, he's going to get out soon. He's going to but no, he didn't get out at all. He died. In fact, just recently, I got a call from India, and this, this uh, uh, devotee there said, uh, oh, a friend of mine's mother has been diagnosed with COVID. What should we do? I said, well, why are you calling me? I said, no, but I want to know what you think. Well, can I tell you the truth, or should I lie? I said, no, no, tell us the truth. I said, don't go to the hospital. Really? I said, don't go to the hospital. You, you, I said, first of all, how old is she? And they said, well, she, she's uh, 64. I said, don't go to the hospital. But, but she might die if she doesn't go to the hospital. Well, she might die if she goes to the hospital. What's the difference? Better stay at home and just take care of her, give her this thing, do this thing, do that thing. They said, okay, okay. So then one month later, this person called me. And I said, well, how's the lady doing? Oh, she died. I said, really? Yeah. They didn't listen to what you said. They took her to the hospital and she died. <laughs> so this is, the, this is what's happening all the time. You say, and Prabhupada told the devotees, if I get sick, don't take me to the hospital. He went to the hospital once or twice. And he said, I don't want to go back. If I get sick, I don't want to go. So... I'm not saying you shouldn't go. You should not go to the hospital. But for certain things, especially if you're older and you get something like COVID or yeah, they say you have cancer or something like that, it's better to stay at home. My father, he got cancer, and he walked to the hospital. And after he got the treatment, they burned him with uh, uh, all kinds of uh, radiation. We had they, had they had to carry him back. He walked to the hospital. They had to carry him back. And he never recovered. And he suffered for nine months and he died, you know, and suffered terribly. He would scream at night, give me poison. I don't want to live anymore, please. It's too much pain. You know, it's terrible. So, you see, and, and, uh, and then I had another friend recently, you know, a couple of years ago. He was a nice Amer uh, Iranian guy. He was a customer of mine. And one day he called me and I said, oh, Harry, he said, I, I have cancer. I said, really? I said, but you, you're always taking healthy foods, you buy organic. He said, yeah, well, I don't know why I have cancer. He said, but don't worry, he said. I want to get some advice from you, but don't worry. 
I'm going to get pinpoint radiation. This is the newest technique. It doesn't go outside of the, where the uh, cancer cells are. I said, well, I said, I, I don't know if you can believe that. Oh, no, no, no. These are experts. They have PhDs, and they've been uh, doing this pinpoint uh, radiation now for some time. So it's, it's not like the old radiation, you know. Not like your father, you know. They burned him, you know. The, this is, they're not going to burn me. I said, okay. <laughs> I said, I mean, I wasn't laughing. I said, okay, you know, you do what you think is right. He died. He died. One month, two months later, he's dead. You know. So all these promises of this, uh, high techniques, they only make money when you get into their system, right? And then, uh, but it's better just to depend on, on chanting and healthy diet and healthy uh, life, lifestyle and, and just avoid all these nonsense things because they're killing people every year. Medical mistakes kill over 100,000 people in this country every year. Is that right? You're in a hospital. Medical mistakes. Sometimes they operate on someone and then they sew them up and then they find out they left the scissors inside the body. <laughs> you know how stupid it is? They left the scissors. They had to cut them open again and take the scissors out, right? And then other times, the radiologist gives them uh, uh, some uh, dose of uh, a painkiller or something, and they make a mistake. They give too much, and they kill the person. All these things are poisonous. Radiation is poisonous. Uh, many of the uh, anesthetics are poisonous, you see. You make a little mistake. Or a kid is born, and the second day they say, we've got to give him some shots. You say, shots? Why? He's only two years old. No, 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 he's got jaundice. Every kid that's born has jaundice. And the way to heal it is with mother's milk, right? But no, they give, they give the little kid an inoculation like this, and many of those kids end up, well, I say many. Autism used to be like, you know, one in 2,000. Now, <laughs> it's uh, sometimes it's like 70, 80, 90 in 1,000. How, how come it's increased like that? Because of these shots. Now, they'll say, no, 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 that's not true. We have uh, scientific proof that it's not the shots. Then how, how come, what's, what's causing it then? It used to be very rare. Now it's not, not so rare anymore. So you see, these things are going on because people are not trained. This training is learning to live a very simple life. This, this is explained. There's a very nice article by uh, Bhakti Raghava Maharaj. And uh, I wanted to speak about this. He says... Every single human being, including all embodied living entities and lower species of life, is burdened by the four same bodily necessities of life, eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. According to the Vedic way of life, these four basic necessities of life can best be achieved by living within an agrarian-based environment where life is simpler and our basic necessities can more easily be met. Have you ever wondered why, historically, the majority of the world's population have lived in Asian countries and why this fact remains so even today? There are injunctions in the ancient Vedas whereby one is recommended to live only in such places where mango trees and papaya trees grow naturally. One should live in places where one can find natural pure waters, where one can easily grow one's own food, where one can peacefully Ten cows and associate with saintly persons, brahmanas, all governed and protected by a good, responsible king. The Vedic culture thus stresses in many practical ways this most important principle of simplicity or simple life, a concept almost forgotten in today's ever-increasing complex way of life. Srila Prabhupada thus explains the flaws of modern society, a society which has deviated in a major way from these simple concepts of life. And quote, Prabhupada, 
The basic principle of economic development is centered on land and cows. The necessities of human society are food grains, fruits, milk, minerals, clothing, wood, etc. One requires all these items to fulfill the natural needs of the body. Certainly, one does not require flesh and fish or iron tools and machinery. During the regime of Maharaj Yudhisthira, all over the world, there were regulated rainfalls. Rainfalls are not in the control of the human being. The heavenly king Indra Deva is the controller of rains, and he is the servant of the Lord. When the Lord is obeyed by the king and the people under the king's administration, there are regulated rains from the horizon, and these rains are all causes <coughs> of all varieties of production on the land. Not only do regulated rains help ample production of grains and fruits, but when they combine with astronomical influences, there is ample production of valuable stones and pearls. Grains and vegetables can sumptuously feed a man and animals, <coughs> and a fatty cow delivers enough milk to supply a man sumptuously with vigor and vitality. If there is enough milk, enough grains, enough fruit, enough cotton, enough silk, and enough jewels, then why do the people need cinemas, houses of prostitution, slaughterhouses, etc.? What is the need of an artificial, luxurious life of cinema, cars, radio, flesh, and hotels? Has this civilization produced anything? Has such a civilization produced anything but quarreling individually and nationally? Has this type of civilization enhanced the cause of equality and fraternity by sending thousands of men into a hellish factory and the war fields at the whims of a particular man? In Srimad Bhagavatam 1, 10, 4. Okay. Very eloquent words by Prabhupada. So, then uh, Bhakti Raghav says, meeting the basic needs of life is meant to be a simple affair which should, not be much, which should not be much time consuming. But it is only possible when we keep in mind the spiritual dimension of life. The real basic needs of life are those of the spirit self. The basic need for every living being is to re reconnect with the Lord in love and devotion. Only then will the person be happy. That we have forgotten in today's misguided society. We falsely run after the illusory temporary material comforts of life falsely thinking we will be happy. It is for this reason that the Vedic culture advocates that we minimize our bodily demands to nourish our spiritual needs. It is for this reason that we find statements advocating a total disinterest in working towards economic development, which further entangles the living entity in this world. And it is for this reason that we find such astounding statements that the Vedic way of life advocates that one actually earns less and remains happy with whatever Krishna easily provides. Only then we will experience real lasting happiness in both this world and the next. Everyone, this is a quote from Nectar of Instruction, everyone requires possessions such as food, grains, clothing, money, and other things necessary for the maintenance of the body, but one should not collect more than necessary for his or her basic needs. If this natural principle is followed, there will be no difficulty in maintaining the body. Nectar of Instruction, verse 2, purport. And then Prabhupada writes, This is the picture of ideal family life. When Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu asked Ramananda Rai about the goal of life, Ramananda Rai described it in different ways, according to the recommendations of the revealed scriptures. And finally, Sri Ramananda Rai explained that one may stay in his own position, whether as a Brahmana, a Sudra, a Sannyasi, or whatever, but one must try to inquire about life's goal, Atato Brahma Jigyasa. This is the proper utilization of the human form of life. When one misuses the gift of the human form by unnecessarily indulging in the animal propensities of eating, sleeping, mating, and defending, and does not try to get out of the clutches of maya, which subjects one to repeated birth, death, old age, and disease, one is again punished by being forced to descend to the lower species and undergo evolution according to the laws of nature. Prakriti kriyamana ni Gunai Karmani Sarva Saha, Bhagavad Gita 327. Being completely under the grip of material nature, the living entity must evolve again from the lower species to the higher species until at last returns to human life and gets a chance to be freed from the material clutches. A wise man, however, learns from the Shastras and Guru that we live 
that we living entities are all eternal, but are put into troublesome conditions because of associating with different modes under the laws of material nature. He therefore concludes that in the human form of life, he should not endeavor for unnecessary necessities, but should live a very simple life, just maintaining body and soul together. So this is Prabhupada. This is, this is what our Guru Dev is teaching, right? Then, he's, then one more paragraph in this, pur, in this purport, he says, certainly one requires some means of livelihood, and according to one's varna and ashrama, this means of livelihood is prescribed in the shastras. Right. For example, krishigoraksha vanijam, vaisha karma swabhavajam. So for the vaishas, it should be farming and agri uh, uh, agriculture and cow protection, and also a little bit of banking. And, and that should be the occupation, simple occupation for uh, vaishas. And then Chatris they have their occupation, Brahmanas they have their occupation, Sudras they have their, their occupation. It's all simple, it's not complicated, it doesn't depend on high tech stuff. So therefore it says, uh, therefore, instead of hankering for more and more money, a sincere devotee of the Lord tries to invent some ways to earn his livelihood. And when he does so, Krishna helps him. Earning one's livelihood, therefore, is not a problem. The real problem is how to get free from the bondage of birth, death, and old age. Attaining this freedom and not inventing unnecessary necessities is the basic principle of Vedic civilization. One should be satisfied with whatever means, uh, means of life comes automatically. The modern materialistic civilization is just like the opposite of the ideal civilization. Every day the so-called leaders of modern society invent something contributing to a cumbersome way of life that implicates people more and more in the cycle of birth, death, old age, and disease. Srimad Bhagavatam, 7th Canto, 14th chapter, 5th verse. So, this is an interesting thing uh, to, <laughs> to hear about because we've all been tricked into thinking we need way more than what we need. And that's why... Uh, the, the title of this uh, <laughs> of this uh, article is uh, Unnecessary Necessities. Unnecessary Necessities. So we should think about this. This is what the main theme the Prabhupada talks about in many places. And unless we learn to simplify our life, we become trapped by complications. And we teach our own kids to be, be live a complicated life. We're teaching our own kids to live a complicated life because we haven't understood what Prabhupada's instructions are. Yeah. Anyway, I'll stop right there. Are there any questions? It's a point that Prabhupada chewing the truth. Give this example. You have others. You have experienced so much with you. You know, you And then you're forcing your child to go through this. Yeah. You know that you didn't get anywhere. You try to go through the same. Yeah. The parents will be very. Well, I mean, the fear of parents is. Well, my kid doesn't get, you know, this education, you know, go to a good college and, and get good grades and study and then become a doctor or a lawyer or an Indian chief or something, you know. Then, uh, you know, how are they going to live in this world? You need money. You need money. And, and you know, how are you going to live in Sammamish? You know, it costs a lot of money to live here, right? So that, that's the ultimate, uh, you know, argument. Yeah. but. That doesn't mean there's no other way. Okay. And unless we show that it's possible to live in a different way, uh, we also fail. This whole system is artificial. It could collapse at any time. Right? We're seeing that. You know? uh, we never thought that you know, your kids would stay at home all day and learn from the computer. You never thought that would happen. It happened. 
right? You never thought that, you know, people start burning buildings down and killing people in the street. and It's happening right now, right? You never thought that, that you could lose your job and not be able to pay your mortgage, but it's happening all over the country. You know how many people are artificially staying in their houses right now around the country? It runs into many, many millions of people. It all depends on this, <laughs> on this election, what's going to happen to them. You know, who's going to pay all their mortgages? Who's going to pay for their food? You know, don't look at what's going on here. This is, this is, this is an exception in the country. There are many places where people, you know, they don't have any money. And there's no jobs, right? They don't know uh, IT, right? So they, their job is in, you know, working in a restaurant. Restaurants close. Working in a, a, a chicken farm, you know, or a, a big manufacturing thing is closed, right? So don't think that this can't happen. It, it's, it's happened before. It can happen again. It happened in the 1930s in the United States where a massive number of people lost their jobs and they just packed everything they had in a car and just drove away. They couldn't, they couldn't keep their farms anymore. Their, their mortgages, uh, they couldn't pay their mortgages. And they didn't know where they were going to go. There's pictures of it. There's stories of it. There's movies of it, what happened in the 1930s. It was, it was a disaster. If it wasn't for World War II, there would have been a big revolution in this country. World War II saved the country. <laughs> you weren't around, right? I wasn't around either. My mother, my family was there. My mother and father, my brothers, you know. Both my brothers had to go into the army. That was the only choice at that time, you know. So, uh, this is like an artificial economy, right? How is it that they can keep things going by printing money? How long can you do that? And that's, what, that's how they're keeping the economy going right now. They're just printing because they can print money. You can't print money. They'll put you in jail. <laughs> but they can print money that's not backed up by anything. Anyway, I don't want to give, give a, an alarm, but I'm saying there has to be a plan, a a contingency plan. What are you going to do if there is a breakdown in the society? What, what happens if, you know, uh, the, they can't decide who's the president because there's too much cheating? It could go on for months. And, and it only, it, they did that previously when uh, Bush and Kerry were running against each other. Huh? Oh. Agur, yeah. And it took, uh, it took two and a half months and finally, the Supreme Court stepped in and gave the election to Bush. And he won by 500 votes in one county of Florida. <laughs> and fortunately, his brother was the governor of Florida at that time. Fortunately for him. You see? But this one could be even worse. It could go on for months and months and months. And if, if it does, there's going, to be, there's going to be riots all over the place. Yeah. So we have to have a plan. Yeah. When everything else fails, Sankirtan is the only solution. Yeah. Well, yeah. Look, that's why we have farms now. I'm just trying to show people it's possible to live on farms. It's nothing happens overnight, but there has to be a vision. Well, why would Prabhupada write all this stuff? Right? If you, if you just, just do Sankirtan and, you know, uh, well, no, he was talking about Varnashram. In the end, he started talking about Varnashram. In the beginning, he was saying Varnashram is not necessary. And in the end, he started talking about Varnashram because he saw it's the only way to organize people uh, because not everyone's going to become Krishna conscious. And Varnashram means you go back to the simple way of life. You know, and the country started like that. This country started, everyone was living on farms. And there were very few big cities. There were no cities in the beginning. You know, 400 years ago, there were very small cities. Every, everybody was on a farm. Everyone was independent. Yeah. 
Okay, Hari Bhagavad Gita is the Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai. No, nobody nobody knows how long they're gonna live. Someone can be ten years old, they don't know how long they're gonna live. You're 